Hank Garrett. On July 18th, 2017, Hank Garrett graced the Meet the Biz workshops with his presence, his love, his heart, and his knowledge and his history. At the time, he was writing his autobiography uh, and he was joined by Deanna Marie Smith. Um, he taught a class and right before the class, we had an interview and a Q&A and he shared so much about his amazing life um, and his history of, of, of being on TV and film. And um, it was quite a wonderful time. It was when we were all together at the studio. Um, and just to let you know, very soon, we're all going to be back there again together. But in the meantime, we have today to watch this wonderful interview of Hank Garrett at Meet the Biz at Performing Arts Studio West. Enjoy. Uh, as I started to say, I was I was on the street, and at one time, uh, boy, I was 13 years old. I was carrying a gun. That's that's the kind of hoopman I was. Yeah. Uh, and Sammy Davis Jr. They got me a gig with an off African American orchestra, and I was a band boy. I didn't know what the hell a band boy was, and what I had to do was put out the charts and the seats for the musicians. And I did. And at the end of the evening, the band leader uh, came over to me and he gave me $50. Oh, wow. and really, and it was like, he said, get yourself some new kicks, shoes. My shoes were torn to shreds. And for $15, I bought a pair of four shine shoes, which were the best. And I gave my mother $35 which is more money than she had earned all month. Wow. And I became the band boy for this, this orchestra. Well, one thing led to another, and 20 some odd years later, I was in Las Vegas, and I was Tony Bennett's opening act. I don't know if you know who Tony Bennett is. Uh, uh, and I was his opening act for four years. How did you, how did you get that job? I was working up in the Catskills as a comedian ah. by material that was given to me by another performer, a guy named Pepper Davis. And I was appearing, and one thing led to another, and as I said, 20 some odd years later, I'm at the Sands opening for Tony Bennett. And in the orchestra, I mean, in, in the audience was Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Sammy Davis. You know. Oh my God. And Sam came to me and said, uh, where do I know you from? You look so familiar. And I said, I'm the kid that you said was going to go to prison or die. And we both cried. And it went from there. I became a cop at one time in New York uh, because I thought I could make a difference. Uh, uh, cops were to me, something to be feared of. Uh, at one time, I went on the street, a friend of mine by the name of Lefty was being looked after or looked for by the cops, and they grabbed me. And they took me to a police station, and they beat me to a pump, trying to find out, trying to find out where Lefty was, and I really didn't know where Lefty was. And they worked me over. And I swore that if I would become a cop, I would make a difference. Well, I lived home, and there's Lefty in the schoolyard playing handball. And I walked over to Lefty, and I punched him right in the face. 
And he said, why you hit me? I said, that's for the damn beating I took because I didn't know where you were. He said, I've been here all the time. And later on, I became a cop. Uh, and as a cop, I thought I was going to make a difference. And a friend of mine whose wife was working for the man who created Car 54. Right. And he asked me if I'd like to come in and read for the car. Now. And this is when you were a cop? Yes. Wow. I'd only been a cop for like a minute and a half. Right. And I walked in and that hiking, the man who created <laughs> Car 54, said to me, you're Ed Nicholson. And I said, no, 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 I'm Hank Garrett. <laughs> he said, just the kind of dummy I'm looking for. <laughs> and Nicholson is the character I want you to play. I went, oh, God. Well, that's how it got started for me. I did a television series called Car 54, Where Are You? Yes. A comedy about the police. Thank you. When I was 11 years old, a guy by the name of Min Pai, he was a Korean gentleman, he came to the neighborhood and he was going to start teaching martial arts. You're saying Min Pai, I think of uh, going. Yeah, Min Pai. <laughs> <laughs> so he started teaching kids for nothing. So trying to get the older people to come and take lessons. Well, I started training with Mince Pie. See, I said Mince. <laughs> That's right. <Sorry>. Mr. Pie. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pie. And uh, for the wrong reasons. I wanted to be a better street fighter. Instead, I learned humility and respect. And it changed my life. Uh, my closest friend was a guy named George Washington Jr. And he and I would actually slept on the streets at that time. And I, 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 there are things that I, I, I can't repeat uh, about, well, I'll try to anyway. When we were training, George was very tall, had extremely long legs, so he could really do incredible kicks. Right. And Min said, Mr. Washington, you do very good, very good. But you throw a punch and a kick, you miss. Please don't say, oh, he said, no. And he said, no, please don't say a thing like this. He was saying, oh, shucks. No, no, actually. <laughs> well, we trained for six hours a day, six months, two years. And finally, we competed against another school. And my teacher, my sensei, came and said, Mr. Washington, you do wonderful, wonderful. But now you make contact, you say, take that, you. <laughs> Can't repeat. Anyway, we competed. And then my martial arts, I got a call to come see about a movie called Three Days of the Condor. Oh my god. To do it with Faye Dunaway and Faye Dunaway, Robert Redford. Robert Redford. And because of my martial arts background, I got the part, which you saw fights in. And I, I wound up winning the New York Film Critics Award for Best Fight Scene on Film. So how martial arts, and I, I recommend martial arts to everyone. It will teach you so many, many wonderful things. It teaches you respect. It's probably the best exercise you could ever do for your body and your mind. And that's what brought me to wherever I've been going. I, I'm still, I'm in the Martial Arts Hall of Fame. I became a professional wrestler. I wrestled as Hank Daniels, the Minnesota farm boy. Uh, and so I, I saw the Minnesota phone for you on uh, IMDb. Oh, yeah, it's one of your uh, other names. Yes. I, I just find it fascinating that you you were going down the wrong path. Oh, absolutely. You you could have not been here right now. 
Uh, the way I was going out, and they said I would either go to prison or, or die. And like you said, Sammy Davis Jr. was, it, he saved you in the way he showed you this other path that you could choose. Absolutely. And, and that you? and uh, a few others that I, that I ran into in my life. Uh, also, Hector Elizondo, who's a wonderful actor, is a dear friend of mine, and we were on the streets together. Mm -hmm. And he became an outstanding actor. In fact, uh, it's going to be at my event coming up. <laughs> oh, when is that? Oh, right, right, that event, yes. So I, uh, I, I am so lucky to be here, and I, I am so happy to be here with you guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, there's so much happening. You know, I wrote, I went through, and of course I, I, again, we had lunch the other day, and I could, I could just, I could have been there for five hours, <laughs> because um, you have so many stories, and, and his autobiography is coming out, so I can't wait to buy that, <laughs> and uh, I guess it's going to be a book on tape as well. Yes, yeah, and, it, the, uh, and it's entitled Up From The Sidewalk. Wow, that's a great title. We, uh, we've been working at the Anne Marie, my, uh, my manager. Uh, she and I have been working on this, just talking about what I experienced as a kid. And um, had it not been for people guiding me, I probably wouldn't be here today. Uh, I was pretty tough. I thought I was tough. But I found out there were people out there a lot tougher than me. I spent a lot of time in the ring. I did get this face from just shaving. Oh, it's a gorgeous face. <laughs> no, you didn't <laughs> see it before. <laughs> and uh, I thank God just about every time because I have not been. God is good. God is really good. I, uh, at one point, I was in a terrible automobile accident uh, coming back from the Catskills. And I spent 13 and a half months in a hospital. I was really busted up. And they said I'd never walk. Uh, my cousin, a cousin of mine, was a nutritionist. And I was in a body cast for eight months. Oh. My cousin came and brought me vitamins, all kinds of supplements. And at one point, they were going to have him arrested for practicing medicine without a license because he wasn't an MD. Right. And they confiscated all the supplements and they threw it in the trash. My cousin came back the next day with a massive box of candy. And he said, give the candy to the nurses. The supplements are on the bottom layer. <laughs> well, I was taking all this stuff and he set up a bunch of exercises. I was using pulley weights to work out. Now, I'm eating all these vitamins, the nurses are eating the candy. <laughs> I left, I was in massive condition. They all had developed zits. <laughs> they all put on about 25 pounds because and they kept eating all the chocolate that my cousin kept bringing. And half their teeth were gone. <laughs> exactly. It can't be, we're, we're so happy that you came here. Glad to see you. And really, all the teeth were gone. So, I've had some wonderful experiences, some incredible experiences, but there again, the boss. And you know what? It's about listening, too. You, you, um, we all get messages in our life. Sometimes it's through p other people. Sometimes it's through signs. And you listen to the signs that help say, hey, you might want to go this way. It Absolutely. might be better for you. Absolutely. And it's, it's it, yeah. But had it not been for the martial arts, 
I still would have gone wrong. Because learning respect and humility, right. I, which I did not have before. I respected no one. I didn't care about anyone because I was living on the street. And when you live on the street, you grab what you can do uh, and didn't care about anything except surviving. Yeah. But because of the martial arts, I learned to respect others. I respected my teacher, my sensei. He became the master. And uh, now I have, well, I had many, many students when I had my, my gym in New York, my dojo. And to have the respect and humility to see the change in the children that I was training right. was amazing. I love how through life we all, we all are teachers and we all are students. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And uh, if, we, we, if we understand that and accept that, it could be an amazing life, an amazing journey. That's exactly what it is. It's a journey. It's a wonderful journey. Sometimes not so wonderful, but when you start understanding what the journey is, then it becomes wonderful. You do voiceovers, too. Yes. <laughs> I, I, you all know the show uh, G.I. Joe? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do the voice of dial tone. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a communications expert. And he speaks like this. He says, okay, from now on, guys, we're going to do it this way. <laughs> Listen to me, because I'm going to be asking questions. Okay, that's not a cowboy. <laughs> and I also do Fluffy and Fast Eddie on Garfield. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Fluffy speaks. Uh, 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 Fluffy is a big white guy, and a big dog, and he talks like this. He says, hi, how are you? And Fluffy speaks like this because he's very small and he's very fast, and he talks very quickly. <laughs> I love that. Also, Matt, I, I don't know if everybody remember Max Headroom. You did yeah. it before on Max Headroom? Yes, I was uh, Asheville, the head of board of directors. <laughs> that was fun, too. Yes. <laughs> I would, that, was, that is so fun to get into voiceover. Oh, I, It's tough, I, though, isn't it, to get in there? Oh, wow. It was, it was great fun. Yeah. Uh, I learned my mentor was a guy named Sid Caesar. Mm. I don't know if you remember Sid Caesar from television. But he taught me dialectic gibberish. And I wound up doing a show in London called That Was The Week That Was. I lived in London for 18 months. And I would be interviewed by David Frost. And David would ask me a question and I would be the Italian ambassador. And I'd walk up and I'd say, And he would say, the bathroom is down the hall. <laughs> and that's what I did. Each week, I did a different character. Uh, once I was a Japanese kabuki. <laughs> now this actually <laughs> I I was training I trained with a lot of different people uh, in martial arts. And one Jap he was Japanese and I was introduced to him and was training with him. And at one point he said to me, Ujido, Ujido Otawasa. And I said, Sensei, I, I don't understand what you're saying. He said, I want you to move your right foot slightly to the left. And I said, you speak English? He said, of course. I said, well, why did you tell me? He said, if I speak English, nobody pays attention. Oh. So I have to be really fast about the boy. Well, 
Uh, we, uh, uh, maybe later we do an improv. Uh, Elena actually speaks Japanese. Oh, <laughs> actually, David, I'm half Japanese. I'm a halfer. Right, but you speak Japanese. Yeah, I'm a halfer. You're a half Japanese. I'm a straight I'm a, I'm a straight <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did this on a show. Yeah. I was a Chinese delivery man. I love your voice. I love it. I, when I grew up, I, 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 I used to, with my cousin, we, we'd make up voices. We made up a whole language. <laughs> That's what we were doing in improv. <laughs> right, right. Yes. Which is going to be a little like in about 20 minutes, we're going to do some uh, fun stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do have to say, uh, um, what is it? Oh, there's a few names I, I, I put down. The, uh, the three, three movies that I remember growing up with The Sentinel, The Jazz Singer. Oh. Um, the Amateur oh, Horror. All of those you did. Yes. I love that. It's such a classic. Oh, I, I've been very fortunate. I really have. I've been very lucky in the business. Uh, just the luck of the draw. Well, plus that handsome face. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you know? yes. I, I wrote down the name Sophia Loren. Oh, yes. Did a film, yeah, did a film with Sophia wow. in the British West Indies. Oh, wow. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, it was Sophia, O.J. Simpson, uh, James Coburn. Oh, wow. And I play a bad guy for a change. <laughs> for a change. <laughs> And Sophia, though we're in Antigua, wow. we were there for a month. And Sophia is my boss's girlfriend. And my boss wants to see her. And I go in, she's in a, a gift shop. And I say, my boss wants to see you. And she said, well, tell him to wait. I said, no, 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 no. Nobody tells him to wait. And I grab her arm and I twist her arm. And I throw her in the car. Oh. And, um, and she's sitting there, and I've got my hand up, and O.J. Simpson is going to rescue her. So what he was supposed to do is put his hand on the back of my head, and I would do the hit, bang my head up against the side of the car. Right. O.J. didn't play by the rules, so he grabbed my hair and smashed my head and cut me open. Oh my God. Oh. And down I went. Now, I'm lying there, and my ex-wife was in a hotel, and they ran together saying that Hank is, is hurt. My ex-wife comes running out, and I'm lying in Sophia's lap. <laughs> and she's blotting the blood with the towel. Right. And my ex-wife looks at me and says, are you comfortable? <laughs> And I said, well, I make a nice living. <laughs> oh, my God. And next thing I know, my wife turned around, ran back to the hotel, packed, and left. She was so angry. Now, and that's why she's your ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> but we reconciled. Now, we're back in, in New York. And we're walking down Madison Avenue, and there was a small hotel on right off 76th Street. We're walking down the evening, and my then wife, and the hotel opened, the door opens, and two guys in suits are walking around, and I said, bodyguards, out comes Sophia. And she sees me across the street, and she yells, oh, hey, Darling, how are you? 
and she runs over and hugs me. My wife goes, taxi! <laughs> Following week, I had papers for divorce. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's so funny is how you can, you can, it's a serious story, but it is funny. It's just the circumstances and, yeah. and the way oh. you present it. And, and life, you have to laugh at life. Oh, absolutely. You have to laugh because otherwise, as one of them say, you'd cry. <laughs> <laughs> but the way you present it, it's great. Sir, I have, we have another special guest here. Um, your manager, oh. Deanna Marie. Watch out for the wires. Yes. Uh, I better be careful. <laughs> there we go. So I want to, I want to know, my dear, how did you meet this wonderful man? Well, I lived in many areas, and uh, I was living in London, which I loved. I was kicked out of there. I was an international fashion designer, and unlike this country, where it seems like we let a lot of people in, they made me. Let's see, if I could have stayed, if I came up with 800,000 pounds, which is almost, at that time it was like a million and a half dollars. Well, no way that was gonna happen. So I said, well, I have a business. I'm employing people. If they said, well, what are you like, you Americans? We go by the rules, and if you want to stay here, go out of the country and apply. In two years, you'll be back. And I thought, my, all my ties, everything I've worked for is gone. Well, I had to leave, and I was brokenhearted. So I thought, I'm going to fix them. I'm going to get back to New York. So I got a job, my first corporate job. I went to New York, and I kind of fell in love with New York, and I forgot the design business, and that's kind of what happened. The only reason I came back to L.A. is my mother was dying. So I came back, and I thought, well, I'm going to get involved in community service, be on a few boards. This one board that I was on was for the um, oldest the Hollywood thing, and, um, Gosh, the women there, they, they put up the money to develop the, the, the Hollywood Bowl, things like that. So it was really exciting for me. So I was in charge of doing the PR for this 107th anniversary. So it just so happened that this one was conned in by the woman doing the entertainment to do this function for just a minimal amount. That's how we met. And he didn't drive, he's a New Yorker, he doesn't drive, and he needed somebody to drive him for a month. And I said, I can handle that, you know, he's a nice man. Well, after the end of the month, I thought, this guy is so interesting, here's another career for me. So it took me three months to convince him I could manage him. He said, have you done it? No. But I've done a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of where we started. And it just proves that you don't have to have experience it helps, but maybe you, you, your, your life goes that you have to jump into other things to make it work. And that's kind of what I've tried to do with him. I'm having a ball. <laughs> Forget fashion design, Wall Street, any of those things. And this book, i got to tell you, when um, we were working on it, he mentioned when we met David, Hank was doing a premiere of this one-man show, and it was comedian skits here and there. So afterwards, people came up and said, you have a book of your life, like A to Z, where you were born, you know, all up to present. And I thought, wow, I could help him there. Because I'm a writer, and that's kind of how it developed. So about midway part, I'd take, you know, we'd have lunch, and I'd take little pits, strips here and piece it together. And I said, you know, I don't believe you. You said you're from Harlem. You didn't go to school much, kept classes. But you write like a pro. You speak so spontaneously. I think you're full of it. Oh, <laughs> and so he looked at me, and he didn't know if I wanted me to be his manager anymore. But that was why I wanted to work with him so badly because he had so many parts of him. So I still don't know how he became so well written with his background. Oh. I think it's just a natural thing. But I'm really pleased, and it's given me another career. They call me Red Warrior. I'm sure behind my back is this Red Bitch Warrior. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, why, why do you have the mic? Uh, and then you, 
you'll answer what? the same question maybe. Yes. What is Sorry. your biggest joy? Well, I think as a fashion designer, you were an actor. And you were as good as your last collection. The people liked what you wore. You were successful. If they didn't, God help you. So I loved, I did a lot of speaking, and, and that was exciting for me. And I taught once, uh, and I loved that. So I guess dealing with people was my biggest joy. Now with him, you test me if, if I'm right or not, he is a little older. But he had quite a back. <laughs> but he looks good. <laughs> so I found I got him um, a little gig of sorts in Idaho. It made me wonder about my background, but I got him to be the speaker at the Juvenile Delinquent Center, right? So anyway, he was wondering how I knew these people, but I got him in. And the, the the audience was like age eleven to nineteen, and these were you know you had to go by, behind three locked doors. You know they were kind of bad kids. So I was wondering because he's a little older. I wondered if it would work if I made a mistake. And I it I was just amazed at how he could connect with them. And that's one of the things he wants to do is to, to deal with help young people get on the right track by having kids do it. So my challenge, as I see it, and it's may not be a challenge, oh boy, is a young, younger audience that don't know about all the things that he's done. Like maybe Tony Bennett. A lot of people know him now because of Lady Gaga. And, and, and everybody knows Lady Gaga. So I would love any help you have, how I can get the younger audience to, to know about these shows that he's done, to get excited about it. And I hope that's what we'll do with the book, Up from the Sidewalk. Oh, wow. The Many Lives of Hank Garrett. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Yay. Yay. And your show, the Car uh, 54, as we know, is on TV now yes. in reruns. Yeah. Wow. Well, you can see him. Of that. When you look at it, the one I love most is he—he he was the baby of the show. He was 18, but he looked about 35. And the one I love most—I'm <laughs> <laughs> really helping myself out. Uh, but the ones I love most is he's in there. He was kind of narcissistic. Oh. <laughs> He, um, he's so multi-talented. I, I really find I'm very really lucky to work with you. I hope that helps me. But I mean it. What the hell do you mean by a little? <laughs> oh, he's a little older. <laughs> mature, mature. Thank you. <laughs> What brings me joy? Uh, this is what it is. Uh, it's the truth. Uh, I've had, uh, being a little older, I uh, have experienced a lot. Uh, I've known a lot of people in my life, and no one has brought me the kind of joy that I'm experiencing now. And I've had a lot of experience in the past. <coughs> when you live on the streets, you get very old very quickly. And I'm experiencing all the stuff that I missed in my early youth. I'm having it now. Mm. That's beautiful. together the first time and and then I found out oh you were his manager but there was something there was something more I just felt that there was this amazing connection this like soul connection you know when you meet your soulmate and just for some reason I I, I truthfully I said oh no 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 there's that they, they have a there's a bond there it's a past life well you know I drive him everywhere it gives you a lot of power <laughs> I made a huge mistake. I taught her karate. Oh. 
And somebody, one of my teachers said, are you nuts? You taught her karate. One day, she's going to say, you really pissed me off. <laughs> so I'd like to say goodbye now, <laughs> because I may not be around later. <laughs> No, I gotta tell you something, honestly. She's a practitioner of, oh my God, so many, many things. Um, <laughs> no, she does yoga for an hour, and then she trains with me for an hour by wow. time, seriously. And she'll put in a full hour of yoga and then go to the gym with me and pump iron. And then I'm stupid enough to teach her karate. <laughs> it, it's called the death wish. <laughs> uh, in fact, I did the movie death wish. Another class. It, it's really been so exciting. And I gotta tell you something, I'm, I'm really having a wonderful time talking to you guys. Uh, I have been going, we have been going to kids that are in prison. We've been talking to children that are incarcerated. I'm talking about from the age of 11 to 17. Wow. The Anne set it up. Uh, we were in Idaho. And we went and talked to these kids. Now I'm talking about kids that there was one 11 year old that has already been in prison twice. Yeah. And it's, it's frightening. And I started talking to these kids. Now I'm not putting them down because I was there. I went through what these kids went through. My son, uh, who is no longer with us, my son spent his life in prison. He really did. Uh, he got out not too long ago, and he was killed on a motorcycle. But when I was talking to these kids, I saw my son's face, and I saw my face sitting there with these kids. And I didn't talk down to them because all I kept saying was, I know what you're going through because I went through the same thing. I had to try to prove I was a tough guy to survive. And God came into my life. Amen. This is what I kept talking to these kids about. It changed my life. <clears throat> and I tell them there's another life out there for them. All you have to do is believe. Amen. <laughs> and these kids wrote me letters. 14 of them wrote me letters. And I talk about Sammy Davis Jr. And I said, Sammy Davis Jr. was sent to me to save my life. And they said, Mr. Garrett, you're our angel. This is what we do. We've been going to these different events. In fact, we went to a woman's prison and spoke to these, these ladies. And all I did was say, 
to every one of these women, you are so beautiful. Every one of you. As I'm saying to you, every one of you is so beautiful. And for me, for me, it's such a godsend to be here because of David to talk to you. Now, had it not been for David, who was an angel, to bring us to speak to all people who are angels. And you make my heart sing. David asked me to come here to talk about acting and uh, improv, and it's kind of taken another. <laughs> oh well, it's it's life. I have one more question, and what we'll do is we'll take a like a five ten minute break uh, just to go to the bathroom one day, um, and then uh, we're gonna come back, and then we'll have a little uh, improv class. Yeah. During that, if you have any questions, you could ask Hank. Hank. Okay. So one question that I have of both of you is, what do you want the most at this moment in your life? Oh, that's the same I think the book is very important for Hank. It's an autobiography, and I think it's his way of giving back, aside from speaking to lots of different people. So I want to get it published. We have a publicist. And we're just keeping our fingers crossed that we meet the right people to make it happen. And if you'd like, perhaps we can get uh, like a preview of, of the first one-man show based on the book. Yes! Yeah. What do I want? God has given me everything. I truly want for nothing. Uh, boy. What I'm experiencing now, I wish everyone would experience. I found the most wonderful woman in the world. I found such an incredible friend. Uh, I've had money. I've had millions, truly. My ex-wife has got those millions. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it doesn't buy happiness. Wow. Uh, joy. It really, really does. And, and I thank you for giving me that joy. 